Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Today we are reading from the book Moby Dick. We'll be reading chapters 32 to 36. Published in 1851, Moby Dick was based in part on author Herman Melville's own experiences on a whale ship. The novel tells the story of Ahab, the captain of a whaling vessel called the Pequod, who has a three-year mission to collect and sell the valuable oil of whales at the behest of the ship's owners. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ underscore media underscore podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 32 Cetology Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harborless immensities. Ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you. Yet is it no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cytology, says Captain Scoresby, AD 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, AD 1839 unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters. Impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea. A field strewn with thorns. All these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier, and John Hunter, and lessen those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, Though of real knowledge there be little, yet of books there are plenty, and so in some small degree, with cytology or the science of whales. Many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little written of the whale. Run over a few, the authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gesner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondelicious, Willoughby, Green, Ardetti, Sibold, Brisson, Martin, Lassipede, Bonterre, Damarist, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman. I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. 
Yet, owing to the long priority of his claims and the profound ignorance which, till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports, this usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the Leviathanic allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross, hear ye. Good people all, the Greenland whale is deposed, the great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you, and at the same time, in the remotest degree, succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beals and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or, in this place at least, to much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systematization of cytology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task, no ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it to grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs, and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cytology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, aloives and herring, against Linnaeus's express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows, on account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penum and trantum feminam mammis lactantem, and finally, ex leg naturi germeritoque. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish and call upon Holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? 
Above, Linnaeus has given you those items. But in brief, they are these lungs and warm blood, whereas all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale by his obvious externals so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more cogent as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat but a vertical or up and down tail. Whereas, among spouting fish the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien asters kens, all the smaller, spouting, and horizontal-tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cytology. Now, then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. Asterisk I am aware that down to the present time, the fish-styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish of the coffins of Nantucket are included by many naturalists among the whales. But as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible set, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, I deny their credentials as whales and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of cytology. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. I, the folio whale, two. The octavo whale, three. The duodecimo whale, as the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale of the octavo, the grampus of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Folios. Among these I here include the following chapters, I. The sperm whale, two. The right whale, three. The finback whale, four. The humpbacked whale, V. The razorback whale, 6. The Sulphur Bottom Whale Book 1 Folio, Chapter 1, Sperm Whale This whale, among the English of old vaguely known as the Trumpa Whale and the Visitor Whale and the Anvil-Headed Whale, is the present cachalot of the French and the Potsvich of the Germans and the Macrocephalus of the Long Words. He is, without doubt, the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect, and lastly, by far the most valuable in commerce, he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his own proper individuality and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea also that the same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times, also, spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. 
it was only to be had from the druggists as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine, in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book 1 Folio Chapter 2 Right Whaled In one respect this is the most venerable of the leviathans being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, he is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles, the whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized. What then is the whale? which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mysticetus of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the Boline ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Groland's wallfish of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean on the Brazil banks, on the Norwest coast, and various other parts of the world designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans. But they precisely agree in all their grand features, nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will be elsewhere treated of at some length with reference to elucidating the sperm whale. Book 1 Folio Chapter 3 Finbacta Under this head I reckon a monster which by the various names of Finback, Tall Spout, and Long John, has been seen almost in every sea and is commonly the whale whose distant jet is so often described by passengers crossing the Atlantic in the New York packet tracks. In the length he attains, and in his baleen, the Finback resembles the right whale, but is of a less portly girth and a lighter color approaching to olive. His great lips present a cable-like aspect formed by the intertwisting, slanting folds of large wrinkles. His grand distinguishing feature, the fin, from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back of an angular shape and with a very sharp pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will, at times, be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial, with its style and wavy hour lines graved on it. On that a has dial, the shadow often goes back. The fin back is not gregarious. He seems a whale hater, as some men are man haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon a barren plain gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable king of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. From having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale, 
among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales, that is, whales with baleen. Of these so-called whalebone whales, there would seem to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, bunched whales, underjawed whales and rostrated whales are the fishermen's names for a few sorts. In connection with this appellative of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that however such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kind of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt a clear classification of the leviathan founded upon either his baleen or hump or fin or teeth. Notwithstanding that those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis for a regular system of cytology than any other detached bodily distinctions which the whale, in his kinds, presents. How then? The baleen, hump, backfin, and teeth these are things whose peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whales without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure in other and more essential particulars. Thus, the sperm whale and the humpbacked whale each has a hump, but there the similitude ceases. Then, the same humpbacked whale and the Greenland whale, each of these has baleen, but there again the similitude ceases. And it is just the same with the other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales, they form such irregular combinations, or, in the case of any one of them detached, such an irregular isolation as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis. On this rock, every one of the whale naturalists has split. But it may possibly be conceived that, in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy, there, at least, we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, what thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen it is impossible correctly to classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, why there you will not find distinctions a fiftieth part as available to the systematizer as those external ones already enumerated. What then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whales bodily in their entire liberal volume and boldly sort them that way. And this is the bibliographical system here adopted and it is the only one that can possibly succeed for it alone is practicable. To proceed. Book 1. Folio Chapter 4. Humpbacked. This whale is often seen on the northern American coast. He has been frequently captured there and towed into harbor. He has a great pack on him like a peddler or you might call him the elephant and castle whale. At any rate, the popular name for him does not sufficiently distinguish him since the sperm whale also has a hump though a smaller one. His oil is not very valuable. He has baleen. He is the most gamesome and light-hearted of all the whales, making more gay foam and white water generally than any other of them. Book 1 Folio Chapter 5 Razorback dot of this whale little is known but his name. I have seen him at a distance off Cape Horn. Of a retiring nature, he eludes both hunters and philosophers. Though no coward, he has never yet shown any part of him but his back, which rises in a long sharp ridge. Let him go. I know little more of him, nor does anybody else. Book 1 Folio Chapter 6 Sulphur Bottom Dot Another retiring gentleman with a brimstone belly doubtless got by scraping along the Tartarian tiles in some of his profounder divings. 
He is seldom seen, at least I have never seen him except in the remoter southern seas, and then always at too great a distance to study his countenance. He is never chased, he would run away with rope walks of line. Prodigies are told of him. Adieu, sulfur bottom. I can say nothing more that is true of ye, nor can the oldest Nantucketer. Thus ends Book 1. Folio, and now begins Book 2. Octavo. Octavos asterisk, these embrace the whales of middling magnitude, among which present may be numbered I, the Grampus, 2, the Blackfish, 3, the Narwhal, 4, the Thrasher, V, the Killer. Asterisk why this book of whales is not denominated the quarto is very plain. Because, while the whales of this order, though smaller than those of the former order, nevertheless retain a proportionate likeness to them in figure, yet the bookbinder's quarto volume in its dimension form does not preserve the shape of the folio volume, but the octavo volume does. Book 2 Octavo Chapter 1 Grampus, though this fish, whose loud sonorous breathing, or rather blowing, has furnished a proverb to landsmen, is so well known a denizen of the deep, yet is he not popularly classed among whales. But possessing all the grand distinctive features of the Leviathan, most naturalists have recognized him for one. He is of moderate octavo size, varying from 15 to 25 feet in length, and of corresponding dimensions round the waist. He swims in herds, he is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity and pretty good for light. By some fishermen his approach is regarded as premonitory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book 2 Octavo Chapter 2 Black Fish I give the popular fishermen's names for all these fish, for generally they are the best. Where any name happens to be vague or inexpressive, I shall say so and suggest another. I do so now, touching the black fish, so-called, because blackness is the rule among almost all whales. So call him the hyena whale, if you please. His veracity is well known, and from the circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. This whale averages some 16 or 18 feet in length. He is found in almost all latitudes. He has a peculiar way of showing his dorsal hooked fin in swimming, which looks something like a Roman nose. When not more profitably employed, the sperm whale hunters sometimes capture the hyena whale to keep up the supply of cheap oil for domestic employment as some frugal housekeepers, in the absence of company and quite alone by themselves, burn unsavory tallow instead of odorous wax. Though their blubber is very thin, some of these whales will yield you upwards of 30 gallons of oil. Book 2 Octavo, Chapter 3 Narwhal, that is, Nostril Whaled, another instance of a curiously named whale, so named I suppose from his peculiar horn being originally mistaken for a peaked nose. The creature is some 16 feet in length, while its horn averages 5 feet, though some exceed 10 and even attain to 15 feet. Strictly speaking, this horn is but a lengthened tusk, growing out from the jaw in a line a little depressed from the horizontal. But it is only found on the sinister side, which has an ill effect, giving its owner something analogous to the aspect of a clumsy left-handed man. What precise purpose this ivory horn or lance answers, it would be hard to say. It does not seem to be used like the blade of the swordfish and billfish, though some sailors tell me that the narwhal employs it for a rake in turning over the bottom of the sea for food. Charlie Coffin said it was used for an ice piercer, for the narwhal, 
rising to the surface of the polar sea and finding it sheeted with ice, thrusts his horn up and so breaks through. But you cannot prove either of these surmises to be correct. My own opinion is that however this one-sided horn may really be used by the narwhal, however that may be, it would certainly be very convenient to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. The narwhal I have heard called the tusked whale, the horned whale, and the unicorn whale. He is certainly a curious example of the unicornism to be found in almost every kingdom of animated nature. From certain cloistered old authors I have gathered that the same sea unicorn's horn was in ancient days regarded as the great antidote against poison and as such, preparations of it brought immense prices. It was also distilled to a volatile salts for fainting ladies, the same way that the horns of the male deer are manufactured into heart's horn. Originally it was in itself accounted an object of great curiosity. Black Letter tells me that Sir Martin Frobisher on his return from that voyage, when Queen Bess did gallantly wave her jeweled hand to him from a window of Greenwich Palace as his bold ship sailed down the Thames, when Sir Martin returned from that voyage, saith Black Letter, on bended knees he presented to Her Highness a prodigious long horn of the narwhal, which for a long period after hung in the castle at Windsor. An Irish author avers that the Earl of Leicester, on bended knees, did likewise present to Her Highness another horn pertaining to a land beast of the unicorn nature. The narwhal has a very picturesque, leopard-like look, being of a milk-white ground color dotted with round and oblong spots of black. His oil is very superior, clear and fine, but there is little of it and he is seldom hunted. He is mostly found in the circumpolar seas. Book 2 Octavo Chapter 4 Killer Dut of this whale little is precisely known to the Nantucketer and nothing at all to the professed naturalist. From what I have seen of him at a distance, I should say that he was about the bigness of a grampus. He is very savage, a sort of Fiji fish. He sometimes takes the great folio whales by the lip and hangs there like a leech till the mighty brute is worried to death. The killer is never hunted. I never heard what sort of oil he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctness. For we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonaparte's and sharks included. Book 2 Octavo Chapter 5 Thrashered this gentleman is famous for his tail, which he uses for a feral in thrashing his foes. He mounts the folio whale's back, and as he swims, he works his passage by flogging him as some schoolmasters get along in the world by a similar process. Still less is known of the thrasher than of the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Thus ends Book 2. Octavo and begins book three. Duodecimo. Duodecimos. These include the smaller whales. I. The Hassa porpoise. Two. The Algerine porpoise. Three. The mealy mouthed porpoise. To those who have not chanced specially to study the subject, it may possibly seem strange that fishes not commonly exceeding four or five feet should be marshaled among whales, a word which, in the popular sense, always conveys an idea of hugeness. But the creatures set down above as duodecimos are infallibly whales, by the terms of my definition of what a whale is, i.e. a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. Book 3 Duodecimo Chapter 1 has a porpoise. This is the common porpoise found almost all over the globe. The name is of my own bestowal, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, 
and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus because he always swims in hilarious shoals which upon the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a 4th of July crowd. Their appearance is generally hailed with delight by the mariner. Full of fine spirits, they invariably come from the breezy billows to windward. They are the lads that always live before the wind. They are accounted a lucky omen. If you yourself can withstand three cheers at beholding these vivacious fish, then heaven help ye, the spirit of godly gamesomeness is not in ye. A well-fed, plump huzzah porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil. But the fine and delicate fluid extracted from his jaws is exceedingly valuable. It is in request among jewelers and watchmakers. Sailors put it on their hones. Porpoise meat is good eating, you know. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him and you will then see the great sperm whale himself in miniature. Book 3 Duodecimo Chapter 2 Algerine Porpoise a Pirate Very Savage He is only found, I think, in the Pacific. He is somewhat larger than the Hazza Porpoise, but much of the same general make. Provoke him and he will buckle to a shark. I have lowered for him many times, but never yet saw him captured. Book 3 Duodecimo Chapter 3 Mealy Mouth Porpoise, the largest kind of porpoise and only found in the Pacific so far as it is known. The only English name by which he has hitherto been designated is that of the fisher's right whale porpoise from the circumstance that he is chiefly found in the vicinity of that folio. In shape, he differs in some degree from the Hazza porpoise, being of a less rotund and jolly girth, indeed, he is of quite a neat and gentlemanlike figure. He has no fins on his back, most other porpoises have, he has a lovely tail and sentimental Indian eyes of a hazel hue. But his mealy mouth spoils all. Though his entire back down to his side fins is of a deep sable, yet a boundary line, distinct as the mark in a ship's hull, called the bright waist, that line streaks him from stem to stern with two separate colors, black above and white below. The white comprises part of his head and the whole of his mouth, which makes him look as if he had just escaped from a felonious visit to a meal bag. A most mean and mealy aspect. His oil is much like that of the common porpoise. Beyond the duodecimo, this system does not proceed inasmuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above you have all the leviathans of note. But there are a rabble of uncertain, fugitive, half-fabulous whales, which, as an American whaleman, I know by reputation, but not personally. I shall enumerate them by their forecastle appellations, for possibly such a list may be valuable to future investigators who may complete what I have here but begun. If any of the following whales shall hereafter be caught and marked, then he can readily be incorporated into this system according to his folio, octavo, or duodecimo magnitude, the bottlenose whale, the junk whale, the pudding-headed whale, the cape whale, the leading whale, the cannon whale, the scrag whale, the coppered whale, the elephant whale, the iceberg whale, the cog whale, the blue whale, etc. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names. But I omit them as altogether obsolete and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds, 
full of leviathanism but signifying nothing. Finally, it was stated at the outset that this system would not be here and at once perfected. You cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word. But I now leave my cetological system standing thus unfinished even as the great cathedral of Cologne was left with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower. For small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft. Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. Chapter 33 The Speck Snyder Concerning the officers of the whale craft, this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers, a class unknown of course in any other marine than the whale fleet. The large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact that originally in the old Dutch fishery, two centuries and more ago, the command of a whale ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the Spex Snyder. Literally, this word means fat cutter, usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general management of the vessel, while over the whale hunting department and all its concerns, the Spex Snyder or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery, under the corrupted title of Specksioneer, this old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present, he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such, is but one of the captain's more inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon the good conduct of the harpooners, the success of a whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his, therefore the grand political maxim of the sea demands that he should nominally live apart from the men before the mast and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always by them familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now. The grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea is this, the first lives aft, the last forward. Hence, in whale ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain, and so, too, in most of the American whalers the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship. That is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of a southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it, and the community of interest prevailing among a company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits, not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work. Though all these things do in some cases tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchantmen generally, yet, never mind how. Much like an old Mesopotamian family, these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live together, for all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarterdeck are seldom materially relaxed and in no instance done away. Indeed, Many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarter deck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he wore the imperial purple and not the shabbiest of pilot cloth. And though of all men the moody captain of the Pequot was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption, and though the only homage he ever exacted was implicit, instantaneous obedience, though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet ere stepping upon the quarter deck, 
and that there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrorum or otherwise. Yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor, perhaps, will it fail to be eventually perceived that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain, which had otherwise in a good degree remained unmanifested, through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, it can never assume the practical, available supremacy over other men without the aid of some sort of external arts and entrenchments, always, in themselves, more or less paltry and base. This it is, that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings and leaves the highest honors that this heir can give to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert than through their undoubted superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them that in some royal instances even to idiot imbecility they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ringed crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous centralization. Nor will the tragic dramatist who would depict mortal indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing ever forget a hint, incidentally so important in his art as the one now alluded to. But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess, and in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale hunter like him, and, therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. Oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked it from the skies, and dived for in the deep, and featured in the unbodied air. Chapter 34 The Cabin Table It is noon, and Doughboy, the steward, thrusting his pale loaf of bread face from the cabin scuttle, announces dinner to his lord and master, who, sitting in the lee quarter boat, has just been taking an observation of the sun, and is now mutely reckoning the latitude on the smooth, medallion-shaped tablet reserved for that daily purpose on the upper part of his ivory leg. From his complete inattention to the tidings, you would think that Moody Ahab had not heard his menial. But presently, catching hold of the mizzen shrouds, he swings himself to the deck and in an even, unexhilarated voice, saying, Dinner, Mr. Starbuck, disappears into the cabin. When the last echo of his sultan's step has died away, and Starbuck, the first emir, has every reason to suppose that he is seated, then Starbuck rouses from his quietude, takes a few turns along the planks, and, after a grave peep into the binnacle, says, with some touch of pleasantness, dinner, Mr. Stubb, and descends the scuttle. The second emir lounges about the rigging a while, and then slightly shaking the main brace, to see whether it will be all right with that important rope, he likewise takes up the old burden, and with a rapid dinner, Mr. Flask follows after his predecessors. But the third emir, now seeing himself all alone on the quarter deck, seems to feel relieved from some curious restraint, for, tipping all sorts of knowing winks in all sorts of directions, and kicking off his shoes, he strikes into a sharp but noiseless squall of a hornpipe right over the Grand Turk's head, and then, by a dexterous slight, pitching his cap up into the mizzen top for a shelf. He goes down rollicking so far at least as he remains visible from the deck, reversing all other processions by bringing up the rear with music. But ere stepping into the cabin doorway below, he pauses, 
ships a new face altogether, and then, independent, hilarious little flask enters King Ahab's presence in the character of Abjectus or the slave. It is not the least among the strange things bred by the intense artificialness of sea usages that while in the open air of the deck some officers will, upon provocation, bear themselves boldly and defyingly enough towards their commander, yet, ten to one, let those very officers the next moment go down to their customary dinner in that same commander's cabin and straightway their inoffensive, not to say deprecatory and humble air towards him as he sits at the head of the table, this is marvelous, sometimes most comical. Wherefore this difference? A problem? Perhaps not. To have been Belshazzar, king of Babylon, and to have been Belshazzar, not haughtily but courteously, therein certainly must have been some touch of mundane grandeur. But he who in the rightly regal and intelligent spirit presides over his own private dinner table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for the time, that man's royalty of state transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. Who has but once dined his friends, has tasted what it is to be Caesar. It is a witchery of social czarship which there is no withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you superadd the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then, by inference, you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. Over his ivory inlaid table, Ahab presided like a mute, mean sea lion on the white coral beach, surrounded by his warlike but still deferential cubs. In his own proper turn, each officer waited to be served. They were as little children before Ahab, and yet, in Ahab, there seemed not to lurk the smallest social arrogance. With one mind, their intent eyes all fastened upon the old man's knife as he carved the chief dish before him. I do not suppose that for the world they would have profaned that moment with the slightest observation even upon so neutral a topic as the weather. No! And when reaching out his knife and fork, between which the slice of beef was locked, it had thereby motioned Starbucks plate towards him, the mate received his meat as though receiving alms, and cut it tenderly, and a little started if, perchance, the knife grazed against the plate, and chewed it noiselessly, and swallowed it, not without circumspection. For, like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the German Emperor profoundly dines with the seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals eaten in awful silence, and yet at table all day Hab forbade not conversation, only he himself was dumb. What a relief it was to choking Stubb when a rat made a sudden racket in the hold below. And poor little Flask, he was the youngest son and little boy of this weary family party. His were the shin bones of the saline beef, his would have been the drumsticks. For Flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless, never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world, nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. And had Flask helped himself, the chances were Ahab had never so much as noticed it. Least of all, did Flask presume to help himself to butter. Whether he thought the owners of the ship denied it to him on account of its clotting his clear, sunny complexion, or whether he deemed that, on so long a voyage in such marketless waters, butter was at a premium and therefore was not for him a subaltern, however it was, Flask, alas was a butterless man. Another thing. Flask was the last person down at the dinner and Flask is the first man up. Consider. For hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. 
If stub even, who is but a peg higher than flask, happens to have but a small appetite, and soon shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then flask must bestir himself, he will not get more than three mouthfuls that day, for it is against holy usage for stub to proceed flask to the deck. Therefore, it was that flask once admitted in private, that ever since he had arisen to the dignity of an officer, from that moment he had never known what it was to be otherwise than hungry, more or less. For what he ate did not so much relieve his hunger as keep it immortal in him. Peace and satisfaction, thought Flask, have forever departed from my stomach. I am an officer, but how I wish I could fish a bit of old-fashioned beef in the forecastle as I used to when I was before the mast. There's the fruits of promotion now, there's the vanity of glory, there's the insanity of life. Besides, if it were so that any mere sailor of the Pequot had a grudge against Flask in Flask's official capacity, all that sailor had to do, in order to obtain ample vengeance, was to go aft at dinner time and get a peep at Flask through the cabin skylight, sitting silly and dumbfoundered before awful Ahab. Now. Ahab and his three mates formed what may be called the first table in the Pequod's cabin. After their departure, taking place in inverted order to their arrival, the canvas cloth was cleared, or rather was restored to some hurried order by the pallet steward. And then the three harponeers were bidden to the feast, they being its residuary legatees. They made a sort of temporary servants' hall of the high and mighty cabin. In strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless invisible domineerings of the captain's table was the entire carefree license and ease, the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows, the harponeers. While their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harponeers chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. They dined like lords. They filled their bellies like Indian ships all day loading with spices. Such portentous appetites had Queequeg and Tashtego that to fill out the vacancies made by the previous repast, often the pale doughboy was fain to bring on a great baron of salt junk seemingly quarried out of the solid ox. And if he were not lively about it, if he did not go with a nimble hop, skip and jump, then Tashtego had an ungentlemanly way of accelerating him by darting a fork at his back, harpoon-wise. And once Tegu, seized with a sudden humor, assisted Doughboy's memory by snatching him up bodily and thrusting his head into a great empty wooden trencher, while Tashtego, knife in hand, began laying out the circle preliminary to scalping him. He was naturally a very nervous, shuddering sort of little fellow this bread-faced steward, the progeny of a bankrupt baker and a hospital nurse. And what with the standing spectacle of the black terrific Ahab and the periodical tumultuous visitations of these three savages, Doughboy's whole life was one continual lip quiver. Commonly, after seeing the harpooners furnished with all things they demanded, he would escape from their clutches into his little pantry adjoining and fearfully peep out at them through the blinds of its door till all was over. It was a sight to see Queequeg seated over against Tashtego, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians, crosswise to them, Deku seated on the floor, for a bench would have brought his hearse-plumed head to the low car lines at every motion of his colossal limbs, making the low cabin framework to shake as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great negro was wonderfully abstemious, not to say dainty. It seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person. But, doubtless, this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds. Not by beef or by bread are giants made or nourished. But Queequeg, he had a mortal, 
barbaric smack of the lip in eating an ugly son enough, so much so, that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashtego singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry by his sudden fits of the palsy. Nor did the whetstone which the harponeers carried in their pockets for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones, at dinner, they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that in his island days, Queequeg, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous, convivial indiscretions? Alas! Doughboy! Hard fares the white waiter who waits upon cannibals. Not a napkin should he carry on his arm, but a buckler. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salt sea warriors would rise and depart to his credulous, fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step like Moorish sanders in scabbards. But, though these barbarians dined in the cabin and nominally lived there, still, being anything but sedentary in their habits, they were scarcely ever in it except at meal times and just before sleeping time when they passed through it to their own peculiar quarters. In this one matter, I have seen no exception to most American well captains who, as a set, rather incline to the opinion that by rights the ship's cabin belongs to them and that it is by courtesy alone that anybody else is, at any time, permitted there. So that, in real truth, the mates and harpooners of the Pequod might more properly be said to have lived out of the cabin than in it. For when they did enter it, it was something as a street door enters a house, turning inwards for a moment, only to be turned out the next, and, as a permanent thing, residing in the open air. Nor did they lose much hereby, in the cabin was no companionship, socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still an alien to it. He lived in the world as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri. And as when spring and summer had departed, that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws. So, in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shut up in the cave trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. Chapter 35 The Masthead It was during the more pleasant weather that in due rotation with the other seamen my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port even though she may have 15,000 miles and more to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground. And if after a three, four, or five years voyage she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her, say, an empty vial even, then her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her skysail poles sail in among the spires of the port does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one well more. Now, as the business of standing mastheads ashore or afloat is a very ancient and interesting one, let us in some measure expatiate here. I take it that the earliest standards of mastheads were the old Egyptians because, in all my researches, I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless, by their tower, have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore, we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians. And that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes a 
theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation of all four sides of those edifices, whereby, with prodigious long upliftings of their legs, those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex and sing out for new stars, even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail or a whale just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert and spent the whole latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standards of mastheads we have but a lifeless set, mere stone, iron, and bronze men who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are still entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendôme, stands with arms folded, some 150 feet in the air, careless, now, who rules the decks below whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blanc, or Louis the Devil. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. Admiral Nelson, also, on a capstan of gunmetal, stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there, for where there is smoke, must be fire. But neither Great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze, however it may be surmised that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to couple in any respect the masthead standards of the land with those of the sea, but that in truth it is not so, is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us that in the early times of the whale fishery, airships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island directed lofty spars along the sea coast to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a hen house. A few years ago, this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready men boats near the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete, turn we then to the one proper masthead, that of a whale ship at sea. The three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns as at the helm and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics, it is exceedingly pleasant the masthead, nay, to a dreamy meditative man it is delightful. There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the masts were gigantic stilts while beneath you and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous Colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into languor. For the most part, in this tropic whaling life, a sublime uneventfulness invests you, you hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years and more are snugly stowed in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalesmen, on a long three or four years voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months. 
and it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life should be so sadly destitute of anything approaching to a cozy inhabitiveness or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the tea gallant mast, where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks almost peculiar to whalemen called the tea gallant cross trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cozy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you in the shape of a watch coat, but properly speaking the thickest watch coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy tabernacle and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it without running great risk of perishing like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter. So a watch coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope or additional skin. Encasing you. You cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits called crow's nests in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. In the fireside narrative of Captain Sleet, entitled A Voyage Among the Icebergs in Quest of the Greenland Whale and incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost Icelandic colonies of Old Greenland, in this admirable volume, all standards of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier, which was the name of Captain Sleet's good craft. He called it the Sleet's crow's nest in honor of himself, he being the original inventor and patentee, and free from all ridiculous false delicacy, and holding that if we call our own children after our own names, we fathers being the original inventors and patentees, so likewise should we denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget. In shape, the sleet's crow's nest is something like a large tierce or pipe. It is open above, however, where it is furnished with a movable side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale. Being fixed on the summit of the mast, you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom. On the after side, or side next the stern of the ship, is a comfortable seat with a locker underneath for umbrellas, comforters, and coats. In front is a leather rack in which to keep your speaking trumpet, pipe, telescope, and other nautical conveniences. When Captain Sleek in person stood his masthead in this crow's nest of his, he tells us that he always had a rifle with him also fixed in the rack together with a powder flask and shot for the purpose of popping off the stray narwhals or vagrancy unicorns infesting those waters for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the water but to shoot down upon them is a very different thing. Now, it was plainly a labor of love for Captain Sleet to describe, as he does, all the little detailed conveniences of his crow's nest. But though he so enlarges upon many of these, and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest, with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of all binnacle magnets, an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks and in the glacier's case, perhaps, to their having been so many broken down blacksmiths among her crew. I say that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here, yet, for all his learned binnacle deviations, azimuth compass observations, and approximate errors, he knows very well. Captain Sleet, that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case bottle, 
so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest with an easy reach of his hand. Though, upon the whole, I greatly admire and even love the brave, the honest, and learned captain, yet I take it very ill of him that he should so utterly ignore that case bottle, seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been, while with mittened fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole. But if we southern whale fishers are not so snugly housed aloft as Captain Sleet and his Greenland men were, yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we south fishers mostly float. For one, I used to lounge up the rigging very leisurely, resting in the top to have a chat with Queequeg or anyone else off duty whom I might find there, then ascending a little way further and throwing a lazy leg over the top sail yard, take a preliminary view of the watery pastures, and so at last mount to my ultimate destination. Let me make a clean breast of it here, and frankly admit that I kept, but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving in me, how could I, being left completely to myself at such a thought engendering altitude, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships standing orders, keep your weather eye open, and sing out every time? And let me in this place movingly admonish you, ye shipowners of Nantucket. Beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye, given to unseasonable meditativeness, and who offers to ship with the Faden instead of Bowditch in his head. Beware of such an one, I say, your whales must be seen before they can be killed, and this sunken-eyed young Platonist will tow you ten weeks round the world and never make you one pint of sperm the richer. Nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For nowadays, the whale fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent-minded young men, disgusted with the carking cares of earth and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harold not unfrequently perches himself upon the masthead of some luckless disappointed whale ship and in moody phrase ejaculates, Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. Ten thousand blubber hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honorable ambition as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain, those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect, they are short-sighted, what use, then, to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera glasses at home. Why, thou monkey, said a harpooner to one of these lads, we've been cruising now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here. Perhaps they were, or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts that at last he loses his identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul pervading mankind and nature and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him every dimly discovered. Uprising fin of some undiscernible form seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space, like Cranmer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore the round globe over. There is no life in thee, no, except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her, borrowed from the sea, by the sea, from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on ye, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. 
Over discursion vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half throttled shriek you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, ye pantheists. Chapter 36 The Quarter Deck Enter Ahab, then all. It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe that one morning shortly after breakfast Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. Their most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen, after the same meal, take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady, ivory stride was heard as to and fro he paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented like geological stones with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow? There also you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever pacing thought. But on the occasion in question, those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him, indeed, that it all but seemed the inward mold of every outer movement. Do you mark him, flask, whispered stab, the chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours wore on, Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon, pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Sir, said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads, there. Come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces, were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and as though not a soul were nigh and resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half slouched head he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat, but this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, What do ye do when ye see a whale, men? Sing out for him was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. Good, cried Ahab with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. And what do ye next, men? Lower away, and after him. And what tune is it ye pull to, men? A dead whale or a stove boat? More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approving grew the countenance of the old men at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marveling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again, as Ahab, now half revolving in his pivot hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, address them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do ye see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad bright coin to the sun, it is a sixteen dollar piece, men. Do ye see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me on top mall. 
While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket as if to heighten its luster and without using any words was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top mall from Starbuck, he advanced towards the mainmast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, whosoever of you raises me a white-headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, Whosoever of you raises me that white-headed whale, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of you raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. It's a white whale, I say, resumed Ahab as he threw down the top mall, a white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men, look sharp for white water, if ye see but a bubble, sing out. All this while Tashtego, Degu, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest, and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. Captain Ahab, said Tashtego, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Moby Dick? shouted Ahab. Do you know the white whale then, Tash? Does he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down? said the Geheader deliberately. And has he a curious spout, too? said Degu, very bushy, even for a parmacetti, and mighty quick, Captain Ahab? And he have one, two, three, oh. Could many iron in him hide, two, Captain, cried Queequeg disjointedly, all twisty beat whisk, like him, him, faltering hard for a word, and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle, like him, him. Corkscrew, cried Ahab, I, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him, I, Degu, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat, and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool after the great annual sheep shearing, I, Tashtego, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and Devils Men, it is Moby Dick ye have seen, Moby Dick, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask, had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg? Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing, I, Starbuck, I, my hearties all round, it was Moby Dick that dismasted me, Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. I, I, he shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, like that of a heart-stricken moose, I, I. It was that accursed white whale that raised me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then tossing both arms, with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, I, I. And I'll chase him round good hope, and round the horn, and round the Norway maelstrom, and round perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men. To chase that white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men, will ye splice hands on it, now? I think ye do look brave. I shouted the harpooners and seamen, running closer to the excited old man, a sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye, men. Steward, go draw the great measure of grog. But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck, wilt thou not chase the white whale? 
Art not game for Moby Dick. I am game for his crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly comes in the way of the business we follow, but I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market? Hoot! But come closer, Starbuck, thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, men, and the accountants have computed their great counting house the globe by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then, let me tell thee, that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb, what's that for? Methinks it rings most fast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, men, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there, some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me, I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate and be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, men, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master, men, is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye. More intolerable than fiend's glarings is a doltish stare. So, so, thou reddenest and palest, my heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look. See yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reasons for the torrid life they feel. The crew, men, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See Stubb. He laughs. See yonder Chilean. He snorts to think of it. Stand up amid the general hurricane that one tossed sapling cannot Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis, but to help strike a fin, no wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone? Ah! Constraining sees thee, I see. The billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak, I. I. Thy silence, then, that voice is thee. Aside, something shot from my dilated nostrils, he has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine, cannot oppose me now, without rebellion. 
God keep me, keep us all, murmured Starbuck, lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the masts, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life, the subterranean laugh died away, the winds blew on, the sails filled out, the ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings! Why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows. Yet not so much predictions from without as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities in our being, these still drive us on. The measure, the measure, cried Ahab, receiving the brimming pewter and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then ranging them before him near the capstan with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison, but, alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. Drink and pass, he cried, handing the heavy charged flagon to the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round. Short draughts, long swallows, men, tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, forks out at the serpent snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me, here's a hollow. Men, ye seen the years, so brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered ye all round this capstan, and ye mates, flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons, and ye, stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that, ha, huh? boy, come back, bad pennies come not sooner, hand it me. Why, no, this pewter had run brimming again, W E R not thou Saint Vitus imp, away, thou ague. Advance, ye mates, cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level, radiating lances at their cross center, while so doing, suddenly and nervously twitched them, meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to stub, from stub to flask. It seemed as though, by some nameless, interior volition, he would fain have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the lightened jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stub and Flask looked sideways from him, the honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. In vain, cried Ahab, but, maybe, tis well. For did ye three but once take the full forced shock, then mine own electric thing that had perhaps expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down lances. And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cupbearers to my three pagan kinsmen there, Yon three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners. Disdain the task? What, 
when the great pope washes the feet of beggars using his tiara for your? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood with the detached iron part of their harpoons, some three feet long, held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Can't them, can't them over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so, now, ye cupbearers, advance. The irons. Take them, hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now, three to three, ye stand commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck! But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners. Drink and swear, ye men that men the deathful whale boats bow, death to Moby Dick. God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. The long, barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the white whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled, and turned, and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed and Ahab retired within his cabin.